Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes as we pray. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege we have once again for the Bible study today. Thank you for your children that in spite of the rain and the conditions around, they still have enough love and interest to come. And I pray, O oh Lord, our coming will not be in vain in Jesus' name. For everyone here hearing your word, I pray, Lord, that this word will have definite impact in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. And for those who are hearing uh, from the tapes, from the cassettes, I pray the same blessing we are receiving here, they will receive also in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. When Joel chapter 2, I want to tell our young people in particular that these are special studies that every Christian needs. And our young people will need these studies on the Holy Spirit and all the other studies we'll be looking at in the book of Joel. We've started for some time. I went now in Joel chapter 2. I'm still looking at verses 28 and 29. Joel 2, verse 28, verse 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And then it says, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions also upon the servants and the hand, upon the handmaids in those days. I will pour out my spirit. We've been looking at those two verses of scripture. And from those two verses of scripture, we've been having a series on the Holy Spirit. Actually, in our study of Joel, this is study 11. You see, most Christians, when they think about the Holy Spirit, they limit the work, they limit the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. Some Christians, they even think they are honoring the Holy Spirit and they limit him to just doing miraculous deeds, signs and wonders, which only affect the body and may affect the material, physical world. But as for such Christians, the oppression of the gifts of the Spirit in healing the body, in removing mountains of problems, for them, that will be the greatest, greatest thing that the Holy Spirit can do, that He will ever do. But you need to understand that these signs and wonders can be experienced, however, without preparing us for heaven. Isn't that what Jesus said? In Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, looking at it from verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name have we cast out devils? And in your name have we done many wonderful works. Those are the works, those are the deeds, those are the operations of the Holy Spirit through the gifts of the Spirit. And yet Jesus said then, when I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And you see, we can have all those manifestations, and yet they may not prepare us for heaven. There must be something else then. That the Holy Spirit does. And that the Holy Spirit will do in our lives. That will qualify us for heaven. And those things. Because they prepare us for heaven. And these ones do not prepare us for heaven. And there must be something the Spirit of God will do. Greater. More significant. More important than all these. And look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm reading to you from verse 1. It says, Though I speak of the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity and become as sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. You understand this? 
And when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, the initial evidence says that we speak in a new tongue, new language, tongues of men and of angels. And yet it says we may have all that, diverse kinds of tongues, and yet not be prepared for heaven. Then it says, and though I have the gift of prophecy, doesn't that come by the Holy Ghost? And understand all mysteries, doesn't that come by the Holy Ghost and all knowledge? And though I have all faith, the gift of faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. You see that? A person may have the operations, the manifestations, administration of the Holy Spirit in his life so much that he understands mysteries, he has all knowledge, he has a gift of prophecy and a gift of faith, and mountains are removed, and yet, and yet, and yet, not get to heaven. And then it says, and though, I bestow all my gifts to feed the poor. And though I give my body to be burnt, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. You understand then that all those deeds, great, 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 mighty deeds, even though we have them through the power, through the anointing, the unction of the Holy Ghost, if we do not search and find out other things that the Spirit of God does, and allow that to take root and effect in our lives. We might just be saying, I have the Holy Ghost. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. I have the gifts of the Spirit. And yet, not have uh, the, the great thing that the Holy Spirit actually does. It's, you see, we're not honoring the Holy Spirit when we overlook or when we neglect His act of transformation, which makes us ready for heaven because he conforms us to the very image of Christ. It is the transformation of our character by the Holy Spirit which gives us assurance that we belong to God and which prepares us, makes us ready for the coming of Christ. Signs and wonders, healings and miracles, mountain-moving faith and problem-solving power without character transformation and heart purity they are not enough to qualify us for heaven. And that's why we're looking today at uh, this subject, character transformation by the Holy Spirit. Character transformation by the Holy Spirit. Hey, look at Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you. What will be the effect of that? What will be the result of that? And cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. And you know, a Pentecostal Christians in particular, a Pentecostal preachers in particular, they need to understand that when we are full of the Holy Ghost, saturated with the Holy Ghost, and we have the Holy Spirit within us, in our heart, in our soul, in our spirit, and that spirit of fire comes in. He burns the chaff in our lives. All the redundant things that ought not to be there, he burns everything up. And then it says, I'm putting my spirit within you for this reason, so that I'll make you, cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. As the Holy Spirit is telling us in the Old Testament that, Character transformation is by the power of the Holy Ghost. The same thing he tells us in the New Testament in, in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm reading to you from verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And you see what the spirit of God does? That, that spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes us free from the law of sin and the law of death. Well, it's very clear then that uh, the Holy Spirit, when he takes absolute control, complete control over our lives, it transforms us, turns us around, makes us to live the life that will glorify God, that a child of God ought to live. There are three points we're going to consider in our study of today. Number one, the personality of the Holy Spirit. The personality of the Holy Spirit. Number two, purity. 
through the Holy Spirit. And then number three, power through the Holy Spirit. Number one, the personality of the Holy Spirit. And we're looking at this, you know why? Because some Christians do not know that the Holy Spirit has divine personality. Because of the emblems or the symbols that are used to represent the Holy Spirit. If you look at the scripture, the Holy Spirit is represented, symbolized with water, wind, oil, dough. And because of that, many people do not know that uh, the Holy Spirit has personality. And they look at him as just a force, a mighty power. After all, don't you see the symbols? But uh, you want to remember that Jesus Christ also is represented as a rock. Represented as vine. Represented as temple and ark. And yet, he has a divine personality. So also the Holy Ghost is a divine person. And the, uh, the personality of the Holy Spirit is revealed very clearly in the very fact that he does many things. Let me just reveal them to you. And in these scriptures that we read about the Holy Spirit, you'll know it's only a person. Divine, high, exalted, powerful person that can do all this. And all these attributes are attributes of a divine personality. In Job chapter 33, Job chapter 33, verse 4, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. And that's talking about the Holy Spirit. You know what he does? He is involved in creation. And here the, uh, the person that said this is still testifying to the very fact that he couldn't have existed, he couldn't have been made, he couldn't have been created without the power, the involvement of the Holy Ghost, the, Ho the Spirit of God has made me the breath of the Almighty, has given me life. And not only that, as, as we see other activities of the Holy Spirit, uh, you will see that he, he actually, he must have, definitely has personality. Just like the Father's divine personality, the Son has divine personality. The Holy Spirit you has divine personality. In Genesis chapter 6. Genesis 6, verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, Yet his day shall be an hundred and twenty years. Here the Lord said, It's the spirit of the Lord that has been striving with man. What does that mean? Convincing him. Convicting him. Drawing him. Telling him, Don't, don't, don't continue like that. It's telling man that God loves you. He doesn't want to bring this, delude, this flood upon you. God doesn't want to judge you. Seek the face of the Lord. And he was telling those sons of men that were running after uh, the daughters, uh, sons of God, running after the sons of uh, the daughters of men. Telling them, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't make such marriages. But then the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with men because after all, he is flesh. And that tells you then, if the spirit of God has that attribute of striving with men, convincing men, convicting men, wanting to draw them away from their path of sinning and iniquity. It must mean then he has divine personality. It's not only that in Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. Uh, we're looking at it now from verse 3 and from verse 4. Acts 5, 3 and 4. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? To lie to the Holy Ghost. Wait a minute. You cannot lie to an inanimate object. You cannot lie to a building. You cannot lie to a tree. You cannot lie to a pole. If you lie to someone, 
that person, that individual has to have personality. And so Peter said that you have lied to the Holy Ghost to keep back part of the price of the land. Whilst it remained, was it not in thy own power? And after that it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this sin in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. He calls him the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost in verse 3. In verse 4, he calls him God. That means then he has divine personality. In Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. From verse uh, 30. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Well, the same thing I said when we read Acts chapter 5. The same thing we can say here. You cannot grieve the pole standing there. The pole doesn't know what you do. Knock it. Pour water on it. Paint it. Scrape it. The pole doesn't, doesn't have any feeling. You cannot grieve that pole. And the same thing with the tree. You cannot grieve the tree. And that's an inanimate object. But a personality. Someone that has life. Someone that has feeling. And that's the person, that's the individual you can grieve. When it says then, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Whereby he is sealed unto the day of redemption. It means that the Holy Spirit is not just a mere force. He has divine personality. By the way, what are the things that grieve the Spirit of God? That after a man, after a woman has been saved, and he has a measure of the presence of the Holy Spirit in him, and is sanctified, he has a greater measure of the presence and the influence and the transformation power of the Holy Spirit in him. And when he's baptized in the Holy Ghost, he has a greater, greater, greater measure of the presence and the influence and the power and the dynamite of the Holy Ghost in him. For such a person, having the Holy Ghost present with him, what can he do that will grieve the Spirit of God? Here, here, here is wisdom. Here, here is what shows whether a man values the presence of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit above many, many things. Because if you want the presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life at all times, by all means, you are going to try to avoid, by the help of the Lord, anything and everything that will grieve that will offend the Holy Spirit. What are the things that will grieve the Holy Spirit? Verse 31. Let all bitterness, all bitterness, even minor bitterness, or, or bitterness that is just rising up like smoke in the heart, or permanent bitterness, just, just bitter, bitter. And the little thing that happened yesterday, he has not forgotten. And the little thing that happened last week, he has not forgotten. Bitter, you know, that kind of bitterness uh, can, can grieve the Holy Spirit in your life. And then it says, and wrath, wrath. And uh, that means, you know, it's like you just want your wrath to come upon people. You are angry at them, you are bitter at them, and you want to show it. And then it says, anger. You know anger, you know. And there are people that get so angry and you cannot hide it. And the leaves are, you know, twitching and moving and your eyes are almost red and you're almost shaking with rage. You are angry. That grieves the Holy Spirit and clamor, you know, shouting on people because of the anger and jumping at them, almost rough handling them. And evil speaking. And that's the gossiping that goes. Do you know that you're grieving the spirit of God when you gossip? And you speak evil of your brother. You speak evil of your sister. Things you have not confirmed. And you're saying them. It grieves the spirit of God. No wonder. And there are many people that just 
and they try to pray and shake themselves like something, but they do not know that the power of the Lord and the presence of the Spirit has departed from them. That's why it says, let all bitterness, all wrath, all anger, and all clamor, and all evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Malice, you know, it gives the Holy Spirit that uh, you, somebody has done, you, you can't have malice with somebody you love. Somebody you love, as I have loved you, so that you love one another. There's no way you can have malice against somebody that you love as Christ has loved us. Uh, you want to see that individual. You want to love that individual. Even if it's just to say, how are you? Good morning. I just remembered you. I just love you. Every time I remember, I'm just, just happy. But uh, you want to avoid one another because there's something in the heart. And there's bitterness in the heart. There's judgment. You are judging those people in your heart. And you're reaching them up. They are bad. They will never change. And they have offended you. And you'll never forgive. That's why we keep malice. And it says, let every kind, every form of malice be put away from you. Because if malice continues, it's going to grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't you understand? The Holy Spirit is like into a dome. And when you make fire, and the smoke is coming up. If that dove has been there, and that dove is so gentle, that, that dove is, is uh, you know, white and gentle and meek, and the dove will not fight against the smoke, will just go away, will just fly away from the smoke. When you have the smoke of bitterness and the smoke of wrath and the smoke of anger, and the smoke of clamor, and the smoke of evil speak, and the smoke of malice, it grieves the spirit, and it just goes away. That's why it says, you want that presence and power of the Holy Spirit to remain in your life. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. We will offend one another. Your brother will say something that, why did he say that? And your sister will do something. How could she do that? It will happen. And if you want to keep the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit with you, if you know the significance of having that power and presence of the Spirit of God with you, be kind, be tender, and forgive one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And you know, there are some of these are brothers and sisters. Uh, what are you talking about? I've forgiven him. What did I do? That makes you to feel that I've not forgiven her. I've forgiven her. The question is, my brother, my sister, you know your heart. Have you forgiven as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you? Have you forgiven as if this man never did anything, never said anything you didn't like? That's the forgiveness that the Lord is talking about. And that's what keeps the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now in John. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Here we're looking at verse 26. We're talking about the very fact that the Holy Spirit has personality. The personality of the Holy Spirit you can see is revealed very clearly. In all these scriptures I'm reading to you. In the fact that he creates and gives life. He has to have personality to do that. He speaks. He teaches. He guides, he reproves, he has his own will, and he can be grieved, he can be resisted, he can be vexed. He testifies of Christ, he comforts the believers, he strives with sinners, he appoints, he commissions preachers, and he directs preachers where and how they are to preach the gospel. 
very clearly from all these things we're reading. The Holy Spirit, like God the Father, like God the Son, also has divine personality. Well, you cannot just regard him as a mere force. It's a divine person. It's God with great power and might. In John chapter 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you. He has to have divine personality to do that. Teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. If you forget something, look up here. You're sitting at home. And then you say, that thing is gone from my head. It's gone from my memory. Your chair there will not remind you. The clock there will not remind you. And the table there will not remind you. They don't have personality. It's your husband there, or your boy, your son there, that will say, Mommy, don't you remember? And yes, thank you for reminding me. Because that person reminding you has personality. If it says, he will bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. That means he has divine personality. Chapter 15 verse 26. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Testify of me. Uh, have you been to court before? And somebody is being accused. And he said, alright, where can we have a witness? Somebody to testify. Where did that thing take place? It took place on the street. Okay, on the street. Oh yes, the electric pole was there on the street. And the electric pole is still there. No, electric pole cannot come and give witness, cannot come and testify, doesn't have personality. Who was there? A man, a woman, somebody having personality is the one that will testify. And so when Jesus said, the comforter whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth proceeding from the Father, he has personality now. He shall testify of me. Chapter 16 of John. Verse 13. Chapter 16, verse 13. How be each when he, he, he has divine personality. You can see that. He, the spirit of truth, has come. He will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. Uh, children, look up at me here. When you get to school, and you want to know, you want to know the truth about that thing, and you want somebody to guide you into all truth, you sit down in the class there, the blackboard there, by itself, without somebody writing on it, cannot guide you into all truth. The box of chalk there, the duster there, the chair there, the table there, the desk there cannot guide you into all truth. Why? They don't have personality. They cannot talk. It's when the teacher comes. And that teacher, having personality, he will guide those children, those young people, into the truth. And that's why the Spirit of God, guiding us to all truth, has divine personality. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Inanimate objects don't speak. Is someone having personality that speaks. And he shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me. For he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Well then, it's very clear from the word of God that the Holy Spirit has divine personality. In fact, uh, the, 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 the word of God reveals that he is eternal, he is omnipresent, he is omniscient, he is omnipotent. Well, point number two. Purity through the Holy Spirit. Purity through the Holy Spirit. 
uh, where I've already pointed it out, you know, uh, for us to even get saved at all, at all, it has to be through the help of the Holy Spirit. Look at John chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you, profitable for you, helpful to you, necessary for you, that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more of judgment of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. He tells us that it's the Holy Spirit that even brings the sinners to conviction. And that's why my brothers and sisters, you can bring somebody to church. You can bring somebody to the Bible study. And the message may be very clear. And another person, another person doing something similar may repent. And the other fellow is, you know, it's like you just pour water at the back of the snail. At the, at the back of the calabash. At the back of the bowl. And the water is off without making any, any difference. Because... That fellow has not yielded to the conviction of the Holy Spirit uh, to even come into salvation and to come into the Christian experience of being born again, convicted of sin, praying and saying, Oh Lord, I know I'm a sinner, forgive me and turn me around. It takes the oppression and the influence of the Holy Spirit. And in John, John chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus answered, verily, verily, that means certainly, assuredly, without any shadow of doubt, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He, to be born again with the influence and uh, the help of the Spirit of God. Uh, that, that's what the Lord is telling us. Uh, that spirit of God is so necessary. And now, after we are born again, we've come to the Lord. We're now in Christ Jesus, new creatures in Christ. All things pass away. All things becoming new. And righteousness comes into our lives. How? By the ministration of the Holy Spirit. A hey, look at the word of God. In Romans chapter, Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. You want to have righteousness in your life? You are born again now. You must give the rightful place to the Holy Spirit. He makes it happen. Romans chapter 14 verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And that means then that if you want to live the righteous life, victorious life, a pure life, life without compromise, life that always overcomes, victorious over every form of temptation, and you need the help and the assistance and the aid of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes to you like that, even at conversion, and that's when he bears fruit in your life. And the fruit he bears, look at it. In Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. And you know, it's not even talking about being saturated with the Holy Spirit without being saturated with love. Uh, you know, it, it, it's good to know the Bible. It's good to understand what the Spirit of God is teaching us in the Scriptures. Uh, because uh, there are some of these people that say they have the Holy Spirit, they're full of the Holy Spirit, they're moving in the Spirit, they're praying in the Spirit, and there is no iota of love in their hearts. Offend them. 
step on their toes, do something they don't like, say something they don't like, and they take you to their prayer meeting, and they call fire from heaven on you. Let him die. Let him die because of what he said against me. My brother, the fruit of the Spirit is love. When we are full of the Spirit of God, and that kind of prayer will be cut off from your mouth. If there is any place among any group of people where their interest is the defeat and downfall and death, of their enemies and the love of God does not saturate their lives the spirit of God is not there the spirit of anger may be there the spirit of revenge may be there and the spirit of judgment may be there but the spirit of God that has the fruit of love is not there and then it says joy You'll be joyful, no matter what you go through in life. Because sometimes the road is going to be rough. And sometimes the journey is going to be hard. And sometimes persecution will come. But the joy of the Lord will be your strength. The fruit of the Spirit that includes joy and peace. Peace with God. Peace in God. And the peace of God and peace with one another. You know, uh, it's, um, we don't understand the Bible, I think, in many ways. If somebody, you know, goes to a meeting, maybe he joins the prayer warriors in the church. And after joining the prayer warriors, he, he, they talk about the Holy Ghost there. And they begin to, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. They don't, they don't say something intelligent. They, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. And while rolling and spinning and whatever, something comes on that fellow. And they don't speak English. Just say, hallelujah, hallelujah. Pastor, pastor, pastor. And then they get something. They said, I got Holy Ghost. You can't talk to her. Every little thing you do, she's irritated. Every small action irritates her. And he it says, it's because of the Holy Ghost. That's Holy Ghost. Vomit it away. That's not Holy Ghost. When you have Holy Ghost in your life, even when you are born again, the fruit of that Spirit of God in your life will be love and joy and peace. And then it says, long suffering. Long stuff, you'll be patient. You'll persevere when the Holy Ghost takes over your life. Gentleness. Holy Ghost doesn't make us aggressive to break others, to destroy others. Holy Ghost doesn't send a person to destroy a ch another child of God. There will be gentleness in your life and there will be goodness. It's the only spirit that will say, give a shirt to that brother. Give a pair of shoes to that individual. Pay that child's school fees. Do this one and do... It's the Holy Ghost. And then it says, And faith, and meekness, and temperance, which is self-control, against such, there is no law. Uh, look, at, look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Reading from verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You see, when we walk in the flesh, we'll have condemnation. When you say something in the flesh, you will have condemnation. When you act, behave in the flesh, you will have condemnation. The Spirit of God will say, ah, 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 that one is in the flesh. But when we walk in the Spirit, and we're walking after the Spirit, and by the grace of God, we allow the Holy Spirit to keep on producing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, there will be no condemnation. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak 
through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. You see that? The righteousness that God intended when he gave the law to the people of Israel and they could not do it now. When the spirit takes over our lives and we are walking after the spirit, that righteousness of the law will be fulfilled in us. For they that after the, that after the flesh, in verse 5, do mind the things of the flesh. But they that after the spirit, they mind the things of the spirit. To be carnally minded is there. When in our thinking, in our action, in our lives, we are carnal. That's going to result in death. But then it says, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject, not submissive, not yielded to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. When our minds are carnal, and we think like we think in the world, and what unbelievers do in the office has more influence on us than the word of God we're learning. How unbelieving husbands treat their unbelieving wives, and we have seen that that has more power, authority on us, we like that. The way that unbelieving man keeps his unbelieving wife under control, and if he says, see down there, you cannot go out, and then he will go out eight hours and come back, he will find that woman sitting there. I like that kind of authority. That's what you are learning. And you will not learn from the scriptures. That's carnality. That's of the world. And to be carnally minded like that is death. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject, submissive, yielded to the law of God. Neither indeed can ever be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot, cannot, cannot please God. If you don't make the transfer, young people keep on listening. If you don't make the transfer out of the flesh into the spirit, you will never be able to please the Lord. But then it says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you now. If any man has not the spirit of Christ, is none of his. That shows then when we are born again and we belong to the Lord, you'll have a measure of the presence of the spirit of God in your life. In verse 13. For if we live after the flesh, if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if through the spirit... You do mortify, put to death, get rid of the deeds of the body, then ye shall live. You see what the Lord does by allowing us to have the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It actually produces holiness in us, purity in us. True to his name and nature, the Holy Spirit produces holiness in us. And then it means that we experience the new birth through the ministry of conviction and witness and he is the one that produces the fruit of love, of joy, of peace, of long suffering, of gentleness, goodness, faith, and meekness and temperance self-control in us. His ministry is to reproduce actually the character of Christ in every believer. And it's the Holy Spirit, you see it in the Word of God, who instructs us, enlightens us, revealing the necessity of purity of heart to us, and showing us the means of grace by which we can experience that purity of heart. 
is the Holy Spirit that reveals the condition of our hearts to us and also directs us to the specific promises of God for our sanctification and purity. And when you've seen that in the Word of God, it's the one that assists us in prayer and in pass that unwavering faith to our hearts so that we can receive and also keep the experience of purity of heart and see what the Word of God says. In Romans chapter 5, in Romans chapter 5, it tells us what the Holy Spirit does, how the Holy Spirit acts in the life of the believer. Romans 5 from verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have received access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, we glory in tribulations, trials, we glory in them, persecution, we glory in them, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And you know, that's all, that's all we need. When the Holy Ghost takes over your life, and it sheds abroad love. And every step, and every word, and every action, and every disposition, and every attitude, and every interaction between you and your neighbor is all of love. There will be purity. There will be holiness. Uh, because it is through that that the Gentiles are sanctified. In Romans, Romans chapter 15, verse 16. Romans chapter 15, verse 16. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel of God and that the offering up of the Gentiles. Notice the language. It's not the offering of the Gentiles, but the offering up of the Gentiles. That is the Gentiles being offered to God. These Gentiles, these people, these men and women might be acceptable because those Gentiles are being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. You'll see then the power of the Spirit of God, the influence of the Spirit of God uh, that brings that sanctification. Uh, you cannot have uh, that sanctification without uh, the influence, the involvement of the Holy Spirit in First Peter. First Peter chapter 4. First Peter 4 verse 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, appear ye for the spirit of glory and of God, the spirit of God, resteth upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evil doer. Or as a busy body in other men's matters, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, for let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them? That obey not the gospel of God. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well doing as unto a faithful creator. You see it from verse 14 that when you're living the life that you ought to live as a Christian, if they reproach you, don't, don't mind that. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of glory rests upon you. We'll come to point number three. Power through the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, we've seen the personality of the Holy Spirit. We've seen purity coming through the Holy Spirit. But now, power. Actually, as we read the Bible, supernatural power is associated with the Holy Spirit. The power, however, is not to be used for any personal, selfish purpose. Because the power is to be used in love. We must never entertain the idea of using the Holy Spirit. He is the one to use us as he pleases. The power of the Holy Spirit was mightily present in Christ. And with that power, he ministered to save the lost and to meet different, diverse, various needs in the lives of the multitudes. The apostles in the early church received the power of the Holy Spirit. With that supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, they evangelized and also performed miracles that led multitudes to salvation in Christ. This is the major reason why we need the power of the Holy Spirit today to lead others to the definite experiences of salvation and walking with the Lord. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Look, look at what Jesus said in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 8. Acts 1, 8. And you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in all Samaria, and in Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the earth. It is, it is for people that were already born again, they were saved. And they were sanctified, because Jesus prayed for them, prayed for them sanctify them, through thy truth, thy word is truth. And now before he left them, after his resurrection. And he appeared unto them forty days with many infallible proofs, telling them about the kingdom of God. Now he told them, you'll receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Didn't they remember, those disciples, that everything Jesus did, he did by the power of the Holy Ghost? Luke tells us, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Verse 14, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And then we are told in verse 32, and they were astonished, surprised, amazed at his doctrine. For his word was with power. And as in the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus Christ, made him to manifest such great power. In fact, um, we're told in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. Luke is telling us from the very words of Peter. In, in Acts, chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. You see the association, you see the link, you see the joining together. The Holy Ghost and then power. God anointed Jesus. That Jesus of Nazareth was the Holy Ghost and power. And then it says he went about. Who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. And even from the Old Testament times, the people that manifested any power as the Lord sent them to minister. They did it because they had the Holy Ghost in them. In Micah chapter 3. Micah chapter 3. Verse 8. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. You see that? The presence of the Spirit of the Lord it will bring power into our lives. Truly, truly. I can testify about this, Micah said. I'm full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Of course, when you come on to the New Testament, what Jesus Christ had promised is what the disciples were waiting for. He told them they ought to wait. 
the authority and the, the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit is so important in our lives that we'll need to do some praying in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. It says, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Tarry ye, he told them, according to the testimony of Scripture, more than 500 people heard him when he said that. But only 120 waited, not even up to half. And it appears that as it was at that time, so it is at this time. Unfortunately, it's not everybody that hears the word. It's not everybody that attends the study. It's not everybody that even understands uh, the importance of what we're saying that actually will tarry in the sight of the Lord until they be endued with power from on high. But thank God for those who are obedient and for those who wait. And that power of the Almighty God, power of the Spirit comes upon them. I pray God will help us. So that as we wait before the Lord, tarry before the Lord, pray unto the Lord, make sure we are saved, make sure we are purified, made holy, sanctified, and then we consecrate ourselves to the Lord, and we pray in faith. The Holy Ghost will come upon us. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. Acts, chapter 4. And when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together. Brothers and sisters, these uh, disciples and apostles, the church here, they understood the greatness of the assignment the Lord had given them. And when they came to pray, all their heart was in that prayer. And everybody they were united with the request they had, they knew without the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost overshadowing them, saturating them. There's no way they could do what the Lord had called them to do. So, with fervency, with unity, they came together. And it says, when they prayed, they concentrated on that prayer. And they were not thinking about any other thing. It says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. May it happen to us in Jesus' name. And then it says, And they spake the word of God with boldness. But brothers and sisters, do you see that when the Holy Ghost came upon them, it wasn't just power? It wasn't just boldness? Yes, the power was there. The boldness was there. But my brothers and sisters, it's boldness against the devil. It's boldness against the world. It's boldness against the Pharisees and the Sadducees, hindering them to preach the gospel. God will never give us boldness against our fellow brother, our fellow sister, to oppress them. So, if you see boldness here, and that's what's coming to your mind, this message is boldness to preach the gospel. It's boldness against the gainsayers, the opposers of the gospel. And it says, and a multitude of them that believe of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that ought of the things which he had, that he possessed was his own. But he had all things common. Do you see love there? As the Holy Ghost saturated them, love saturated them. And with great power, gave the apostles witness. Great power, great power, great authority. The apostles were able to witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. The Holy Ghost came, great boldness came, great love came. And great um, sacrifice and great endurance and great care one for another came. Great grace was also upon them. The Lord will do it for us. I said the Lord will do it for us. The Lord is available for us tonight if we are available for the Lord. He wants to, if you have not been saved, he wants you to be saved. And the Holy Ghost is there to help you. If you have not been sanctified, he wants you to be sanctified, purified, made holy. 
and the Holy Spirit is there to help you and lead you into that experience of sanctification. If you have not been baptized in the Holy Ghost but you are saved and you are sanctified, he is there to lead you into the power of the Holy Ghost. Whatever it is you need tonight, the Holy Ghost is there to lead you into that Christian experience. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Young people, God bless you. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Adults, adults, let's pray. We need the power of the Holy Ghost. To get saved, we need to allow His conviction to lead us, lead us into repentance and into salvation. To get sanctified, we need sincere desire. And the Holy Spirit can give you that desire, that consecration. That faith and the earnestness in prayer until we are sanctified and to be truly, truly full of the Holy Ghost. The Lord can do that in our hearts and our lives. And when we are full, filled with the Holy Ghost, we'll be full of love, full of grace full of power, even full of boldness against the devils and agents of Satan. Be filled with the Spirit.